So again, just to review, you get activity of the postsynaptic cell, unblocks magnesium, presynaptic cell fires, releasing this neurotransmitter that is binding not only to AMPA to, to activate the cell, but also to NMDA, allowing calcium to enter that increases the postsynaptic calcium concentration, which then sets off this cascade of phosphorylation and kinases which ends up increasing or changing, in fact, the number of AMPA receptors. And we'll get into the direction of the change in a second. So a really important property of this form of plasticity that has been identified in terms of these underlying biological mechanisms is that it depends critically on the presynaptic and postsynaptic neurons. In other words, the sending neuron and the receiving neuron both have to be active in order for those calcium ions to enter the postsynaptic cell. And this turns out to correspond to a theoretical idea advanced by Donald Hebb in 1949 that says that neurons that fire together wire together. So basically that the change in the synaptic weight, the change in the connection between neurons is a function of both of those neurons being active. And so we can write this mathematically, the change in weight, DW, is a function of something about the product, essentially, of the sending activity times the receiving activity. So the function is a function of this product of both of them, X times Y, not either one separately. This uh, very prescient, idea was uh, developed by Hebb um, just sort of intuitively under this idea that associations form when you're kind of thinking about something like, you know, fire and smoke, you see them together, there's a causal connection, and that kind of connect, the connection, the associative connection between those items could be uh, stamped in and wired together by, by a, a learning rule like this that says that the, you increase the strength of connections among those kind of Hebbian cell assemblies, as he, as he talked about them, um, as a function of both of those neurons on either side of the synapse being active. So this was a longstanding idea that it was very remarkable when the biology started to get understood that it actually corresponded directly to this classic kind of idea that Hebb had advanced many years earlier, essentially from his armchair after the initial wave of research uh, on long-term potentiation, gradually people started to appreciate that you can't just have synapses only increase in strength. Uh, this will lead to essentially, eventually, all the synapses getting stronger and stronger, and uh, that doesn't actually make the system work better. So eventually people realize there has to be an additional process now termed long-term depression or the decrease in synaptic weight strengths that counteracts these weight increases and creates some kind of overall balance of some synapses going up in strength and other synapses going down in strength so that you don't just end up with these uh, a situation where all the synapses are now equally strong or maximally strong. Research in the 90s suggested that the direction that the synapses change, whether they increase through long-term potentiation or decrease through long-term depression, is dependent on the concentration of postsynaptic calcium ions. And again, this is what we see in this diagram, that the calcium is really driving the overall uh, change in number of AMPA receptors. And there's an actually remarkably simple equation that tells us how the calcium shapes the direction of weight change. So the, the baseline levels of calcium are very tightly controlled and that results in no change to synaptic strength. But if you increase the level of calcium through some amount of those NMDA channels opening, some amount of those voltage gated calcium channels opening, then you end up in this regime where you induce long-term depression. So the synapses actually decrease in strength and only once you get to this higher threshold, we call this theta plus here in this diagram, do you get enough calcium to drive increases in synaptic uh, plasticity. And so that initial protocol that Bliss and Lomo used of really blasting the cell with this massive tetanus 
was really necessary to get it to get above this high threshold and drive this large level of calcium entry. And there's all sorts of reasons why that was kind of an artificial preparation. We now can observe these kinds of changes in a much more realistic regime as the field has progressed. But nevertheless, this, this non-monotonic curve turns out to be essential for understanding at a computational level how learning works in the brain. This is like the Rosetta Stone, the, the key equation, the, the, the critical diagram for understanding at a computational level how it works. This is really the equivalent of the tug of war dynamic that we saw in chapter two for learning. This really tells us how learning works at a biological level. That some amount of calcium produces weight decreases and more calcium produces weight increases. And so our challenge next is to really understand how does this curve actually work to produce a computationally useful form of learning. And in fact, that's a plural. How does it work to form computationally useful forms of learning? And again, we're going to be looking at self-organizing and then error-driven learning. And both types of learning can be driven by this same kind of underlying equation. People would never assume that there's this much understanding about the biology that connects so directly to the computational level understanding of how the system works. But as far as we can tell, it really does seem to, to, to all hold together. Bienenstock, Cooper, and Monroe, and they, um, in 1982, well before these ideas about that, the nature of that curve that we just looked at were published, they developed a computationally motivated idea, you can see it in this diagram, that remarkably resembles that exact curve, okay? Um, just an amazing kind of prescient work of theoretical neuroscience. So in the Bienenstock, Cooper, and Monroe model, they introduced an adaptive threshold. So here we, we talked about a threshold that gets you from uh, this depression regime to the potentiation regime. And, and the key idea from Bienenstock, Cooper, and Monroe was to make this threshold something that moves over time. And this, in fact, can be controlled in an, a homeostatic way which is to say that if the neuron is getting too much activity, you increase the threshold, making it harder to increase those synapses further. And likewise, if it's getting not enough activity, you can lower the threshold. And so this notion of an adaptive threshold on a curve like this turned out to be computationally quite useful. We use a version of that same idea that has a linear shape to the equation and I'll explain in a little bit where we get this kind of more linear version and why we think that actually might be more applicable to what's going on in the brain but you can see hopefully that this curve is just kind of a, a kind of hard-edged version of this more curvy uh, form of the equation. First of all some very nice evidence and this is consistent across multiple different studies that in fact the threshold this this point of crossover between potentiation and depression does adapt. And so this study was actually looking at uh, effects of uh, restricting visual input into uh, one hemisphere of, of a brain versus another. So in fact, if there was less activity in one hemisphere shown in this, this line with the filled circles, that uh, resulted in neurons that more quickly and easily increased their synaptic strength as a function of a given level of stimulation. In the other hemisphere that received a normal amount of activity, you can see that the effective threshold, this crossover point between potentiation and depression, has moved upwards. Um, and so it takes more excitation to achieve LTP in a brain that has a normal amount of overall activity compared to one that's been deprived of activity as shown in this curve. And so this is exactly what you would expect according to the BCM rule. You can also note that the curve is slightly more linear looking. Uh, there is a little bit of a taper up here, um, but it is consistent with our other model that says that it might be slightly more linear.